So every three months we have a pest control contractor that we do as a preventative maintenance. Uh, we go through and I have my maintenance supervisor go through with the pest control. And that at that same time, the maintenance greets the tenants if they're there. And we make sure that, you know, the condition of the unit as well, and that we're not missing any uh, preventative maintenance um, that they that may not be calling us for. It is a common saying amongst real estate investors that you make money when you buy, not when you sell. While this catchy phrase has value, it fails to convey how easy it is to lose money through poor property management. Whether you self-manage or hire a professional, it is important to understand how to navigate the common pitfalls and challenges with rental properties without losing your shirt or your mind. That's why you have tuned in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the Apartment Owner's Guide to Operating Rental Properties as a Successful Business. I'm your host, John Stiles, real estate agent and team leader of the VIP Real Estate Group at Bridge Realty. As a current multifamily investor and former property manager myself, I understand the headaches and difficulties of keeping an investment property from becoming a money pit and time sucker. It takes a solid business plan, it takes tested systems, and it takes key team members to actually find success. So let's take a deep dive and maximize your property value. Welcome back everybody to another episode of Maximizing Your Property Value. I'm very pleased to have you join us today. And today I have the pleasure of introducing our guest who is Rob Beninati. Rob, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Of course. And uh, Rob and I uh, kind of know each other through a Facebook group that Rob is uh, hosting and it has a lot to do with asset management and um, you know, bringing value to this community. And so that's why I thought Rob would be a great person to have on the show. And uh, maybe we can reference that uh, Facebook group later on so people can know how to find it. Yes. Um, but just a little bit about Rob. So he, he is a New Orleans native with over 30 years of construction and renovation experience. He has influenced major projects, most recently a $1.7 million condo conversion. Uh, seeing a change in the market, Rob sees the opportunity to begin a career in commercial and multifamily management. And for the last eight years, Rob has been the regional vice president of development and management to a 600 door portfolio valued at over $100 million in uh, this short time. Uh, during this time, he has helped achieve unprecedented growth and increased revenue, nearly doubling the portfolio's value. In the past, Robert has managed portfolios up to 7,000 units in six states, managing maintenance, construction crews, and property management staff. Rob has a deep passion for real estate and is a certified FEMA inspector as well. He has learned the business from the ground up, flipping houses and house hacking a Katrina damaged property. A hardworking individual, Robert's unchanging passion for real estate is demonstrated in every aspect of his daily life. So uh, that's a little introduction about Rob. And why don't you go ahead and fill us in a little bit more about your background, you know, fill in some of those gaps and let us know how you got into uh, real estate to begin with. Sure, sure. Um, I've been in the renovation construction field, actually uh, about 30 years. I was in uh, the corporate big box um, companies and worked my way into corporate uh, for Lowe's um, overseeing national um, national accounts and then it could be from construction companies to um, construction maintenance and uh, just saw you know a lot of the um, you know benefits of being a real estate investor and uh, learned a lot from from uh, dealing with those kind of uh, clientele. And uh, I left the corporate world and um, went into management when I was picked up by an uh, investor that was overseeing 7,000 units. And he wanted me to go into overseeing the maintenance, uh, construction. And through my career, um, corporate, uh, I also did a lot of construction on the side also. Uh, but the first investment I've ever done was uh, for Katrina, and it was a house that was sitting for two years um, that was flooded, 
And uh, that my first investment property was a full rehab from roof down. So it was total gut and um, did really well with that first uh, house. And uh, ever since I've been investing in uh, real estate and then um, also pursuing uh, the management uh, role with two different uh, investors. Now, presently, I oversee uh, about 600 units now. And uh, he's also investment uh, management and develop uh, development company. Okay. Yeah. Very, uh, very impressive, I think, um, to oversee 600 units or even or 7,000 units at, in your previous role. Um, I can only imagine all the different moving parts. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the different roles in the management structure and the ownership structure in order to kind of keep all those moving parts organized and, you know, uh, everything moving in the right direction? Sure. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that I, I strive on every day is, is to be really preactive, you know, so not only with ownership bringing on more properties, but knowing what's coming, what, what, uh, what market it is, um, you know, it's one of the biggest things in investment and even in management is knowing your surrounding markets uh, or your market uh, competitors, you know, knowing what uh, value adds that you could do to the apartments, um, interior or exterior without over adding, you know, with, without over um, putting too much money into it where it's not going to benefit the rent increase or the expense. So really being one of the biggest things that would really be to be preactive and know what your surrounding markets are and what your competitors are doing. Yeah. Yeah. I can see how that's really important. So tell us a little bit about the structure of the company. And so are you overseeing several on-site managers or what size properties are, are the current portfolio made up of? So the present portfolio is uh, very mixed, very diverse. So we have a lot of uh, duplexes, um, not necessarily single home, but it's uh, from 12 plex to 24 to 30 plex, uh, 72 unit, 68 unit. So um, I have, um, it's actually a, just a team. So we don't have individual managers at the properties. Um, so everything is done. Uh, remotely we have an office but we do have you know leasing agents I have a maintenance supervisor I have a maintenance crew uh, but everything is constructed through me um, so um, you know inspections everything is is comes through me but through my team so we we do not have because those units are small too small to have an on-site property uh, manager sure yeah, that makes sense. Um, so what is your team made up of different, uh, I assume leasing agents and uh, maintenance people. And so what does it look like though for you? Yeah. So I have, um, let's say I have three leasing agents. I have one that is just in the office all day long. Um, she does uh, office calls, uh, help scheduling appointments, um, help marketing. And then the leasing agents, I have them just selling. So they, they do the calling, um, you know, the um, help with the scheduling, but also qualify. You know, that's one of the biggest things with leasing is, is you want to make sure that, you know, when you do schedule an appointment, that that person knows what the rent is, what our qualifications are. Um, you know, if that, if that rental unit is going to be right for them instead of wasting time. So we have a leasing team, then I also have, um, two county, um, county associates, uh, have, um, more of a controller because we also get into the portfolio has restaurants, um, have some service industry, coffee shop. It's very diverse. Um, but that, that, um, account controller basically is in the service industry, um, part of the portfolio. Then I also have, a a maintenance supervisor, four other maintenance guys. And then I also have my own um, subcontractors that we use on different projects and when needed. Okay. But all controlled through me, yes. Okay. 
Yeah, well, that's a lot there. So how do you keep it all organized? Do you have a certain software that you prefer to use? So we, we use uh, Propertyware um, for all that. Um, yeah, I'm kind of old school, but I, I use a erasable board. I mean, I think you've probably seen it on my Facebook. Uh, I posted it. And, um, you know, what, one big thing that's really helped me is being visual. So, you know, I have a board that, you know, has the vacancies. I have a board of upcoming um, people that have put in notice for notice given already. So once they put in a notice given, it goes on a board, we start marketing it. Um, so the leasing agents and everyone knows that, hey, this is coming up. Um, let's get it pre-leased. And um, yeah, and then once it's approved, we move it to another board where we make sure that all the leases are done, um, community rules are signed, um, you know, electricity, utilities are turned into their name. So that's kind of a big part of my office. So it keeps everybody engaged. And then on top of that, you know, maintenance can come in and also see, hey, look, this unit's coming up. And then they're, they're also my eyes um, in the field too. So maintenance is, my maintenance supervisor is always running around. So if he sees somebody moving out, um, you know, he, he gets with me and the leasing team and say, hey, look, this person's moving out. Did they put in their notice? So, yeah, it's a, a lot of a lot of moving parts, but it's um, you know, like with everything, and it's it's huge when you have a good team and everybody's communicating um, to you know have that same goal to have to be preactive on anything, you know, running, knowing people moving out, marketing, so it all kind of gels together, especially when your team knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the uh, being visual. Um, that's how I, you know, best kind of learn and, and stay in on top of things. So that's definitely helpful to have a kind of a scoreboard or something to that effect. Right, right. Yeah, we have, you know, I have a system for everything. It may not be uh, everything in the computer, but, uh, um, you know, the computer, the property where software is accurate. So if you pull up the reporting on, uh, property where uh, spreadsheet it will match what's on the board so the owners you know talking about the owners or um, you know that's only the owners above me but they can see that also so if they have questions they can pull it all up in the, um, the property where software uh, management software and they can see that it matches um, or they can see without coming in, into the office mm -hmm. yeah yeah and so does the owner have a, a certain numbers that they track on a weekly basis or monthly basis that you kind of go over with them uh, at a routine meeting or something like that? Um, I am in touch with them. I mean, I've been with this company for about six years. They kind of know um, my accounting team. They, they give us um, basically daily uh, reporting, especially on, on rent collection. Um, everything is communicated through uh, emails also and spreadsheets. So everything's updated almost almost daily to weekly, depending on what it is. Um, so any any time that we get a um, applicant approved, um, I have my leasing um, office staff, which is one position with the leasing team, um, if, if something is approved, it gets communicated to all the owners, accounting, myself, and leasing agents. So everybody's also getting things through email. Um, so the communication is just constant, um, not only with, you know, visual boards, but computers, emails. So we kind of use a little bit of all the tools to um, keep that communication um, tight. Yeah, that makes sense. That's really important everybody's staying informed and you know staying on track there right so one of the things i want to ask about is how you came up with your team i assume you have some sort of hiring process and vetting process to make sure your team members are a good fit for the kind of the culture that you've created in the company um can you speak to that a little bit sure um you know it's kind of 
a little bit off of, but this is something that I've always done in property management is, um, you know, lease, especially leasing. Leasing is a sales position. I, I hire people that have been in the sales position somewhere else. So uh, one of my best uh, leasing agents were actually um, a door-to-door salesperson. And she was, I mean, it was all commission. So she knew that if she didn't sell, you know, she wasn't going to make money. So um, that's what I look for. I look for people that are aggressive. They, they, they sales people. Um, and quite a few of them uh, actually been out of uh, service industry, like a waiter, or a waitress, because not only, you know, you have to have that customer uh, relations, you, you need to know how to treat every personality. And then also at the end of the day, you know, you work in to do your best to get a tip. And, you know, it just, it's one of those things that, um, you know, personality and being in that sales or that service industry um, has created some really good leasing agent and even property managers. Um, when I've worked for the bigger uh, portfolio, some of my uh, property managers were, you know, bartenders or um, uh, wait staff because they knew that that customer service had to be there. And when you do give that that customer service, um, you know, it goes a long way with, with, with selling leases or selling your apartment, your property. And then obviously I, I would train them the way I want it to be trained. Um, they want, I want, and uh, understand our process. You know, a lot of different property management companies, um, they have their way of, of doing things. And if you hire somebody that comes in from another property management company, they may be used to this one way or this different software, well, you know, sometimes there's, um, you know, conflict when you bring them into a, a different company with a different software, a different um, program, you know, so, but yeah, I've, I've always looking, looked for people that have been sales oriented, customer service oriented, um, and they've done really well. That's how I hire most of uh, my staff. Yeah, yeah, that's really important. I I agree, you know, because the tenants, the residents are our customers, and it's important yeah. to treat them as such. So, yeah, exactly. That's that, and that that goes a long way. Definitely does. Yep. So you've talked about the kind of differences in the leasing process. Um, can you mention anything about your leasing process that you have kind of developed over the years, and what's really important that you make sure your leasing agents don't forget to do this, you know, these steps type of thing. You know, there's, there's three things that have, um, or the first thing is to qualify. So, um, you know, know when they want to move in, wh- how, what their budget is and be uh, upfront. You know, if your, if your budget is only $600 or $700, we may not have something for them. It's going to be, you know, a waste of time for them. It's going to be a waste of time for my leasing agent. Not saying that we don't want them to rent with us, but if it's out of their budget, it's out of their budget. Um, you know, so knowing when they want to move in, what their budget is, and if there's a certain area they want to live in, you know, because this portfolio um, is all over New Orleans, uh, all the way into Mississippi, um, in the suburbs of New Orleans. So we, we ask them, you know, you're going to have uh, animals. Do so you want a yard? So the, um, the biggest thing is qualifying, making sure that they, you, you know, the leasing agents know what they want and they're telling us what they want. And then we can match up um, the right property for them instead of showing them, you know, five units or five different properties. We can narrow it down to the most three, and that way it's not wasting any time for anyone and then we can, you know, um, you know, get that sale or get that, that lease is what I call it. Mm-hmm. So that, that's the biggest thing is qualify them before they, they even schedule an appointment. Yep. That makes sense. Do you typically do your qualifying over the phone or is, is, do you use any software for that process? Um, everything is over the phone or by email. So, um, 
you know, all our leads come into email or through, um, you know, some type of marketing. So Zillow, Craigslist, Facebook. Um, so the ads that we put, we create, we try to answer the questions in the ad. Believe it or not, a lot of people don't read the whole ad. So we still ask those questions, um, you know, before we schedule the appointment. But yeah, most of it goes through um, personally through phone or a phone call or um, through email. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, very good. So once somebody has expressed interest in your, one of the units there, how do you process them? Uh, what's the application like so that, you know, that continues to be efficient use of time and um, a good ex experience for those applicants? Sure. So, um, Obviously, we, we have, uh, you know, forms that we can send them. We, we also have them that we can hand out at the, the appointment. Um, it's an application process where uh, they have to fill out um, their information, you know, obviously, um, you know, background referrals as far as uh, landlords. Um, we also have it on our website. So they can go to our website if somebody calls and says that they're in California, they're moving in. Um, they can go to our website. We can also send it through the emails, which is, um, um, you know, in our drive, it's already saved. So we can just send it out. And we have a checklist too that goes with it. And a checklist will tell them, hey, we're looking for three times the rent. We need proof of that. Um, you know, ID, we are going to do a criminal and a credit background. And it's all um, approved based on everything that we receive. And if it's not, um, if things are missing, it, it won't be approved and it won't be processed. So we tell them that um, also up front. So before we do do anything as far as take a deposit or anything like that, we do let them know that until they have all that information, we, won't, we will not give them an answer until we do qualify them correctly. Yep. Yeah, yeah very good. And I know you've, you mentioned earlier about your – your scoreboards or leaderboards where you keep track of these available units. Um, are you also tracking like number of showings or the time on market and that, that type of stuff? Yeah. So, um, that was kind of like two different, uh, questions, but the board and in the computer, it does show exactly when they move out. So that's going to tell us when they moved out, when it got it, when it was available, when our maintenance went in, to clean or paint, whatever, and then when it is available. Um, I also write notes in the computer. So if, um, you know, the owners or accounting or whatever wants to see it and they're not in the office, they can tell, they can see that, you know, we're renovating the bathroom or we had to change some cabinet. So the bigger things like that are definitely going to be noted. Um, and then after it's finished, you know, it does say that it's um, available. Um, then far as, um, the other question, yes, the leads and everything, the leasing agents do that. So every day they have a little recap that they have to, um, fill out and it's actually on their calendar. Um, in their calendar, it says, uh, how many leads they had, how many emails, how many showings, um, where that lead came from, which is very important. So it's basically, um, you know, you, you um, your KPI, so it's going to tell you where those leads came from, um, you know, if they were qualified, if they weren't. So, mm -hmm. yes, it's a team effort with the leasing team, and we do keep track of all that. Yeah. Speaking about where the leads came from, in your marketplace, do you uh, typically have to do a lot of or spend a lot on marketing, or is it mostly through free advertising like, you know, Facebook Marketplace and that type of thing? You know what? Um, I use every free thing that there is. Uh, I'm telling you, my marketing um, expense per year is maybe five hundred dollars. Okay. And it's not, I'm not exaggerating. And and the the things that I buy are um, like keychains. Like we have keychains for everyone that moves in. Um, we put a keychain from from our management company with the phone number. And when they get their keys, when they do the move in, they have a keychain on their key. So they know, you know, this is a nice little gift, but, um, you know, if they meet friends, all they do is just look at their key. They see, 
that keychain and that and I'll contact every day. Um, you know, pens, um, things like that. That that's really where most of my marketing is. But everything else is through uh, Zillow, Hotpad, Craigslist, Facebook. Um, Craigslist still works. I mean, it works up, it, and it's all free. So yeah, that's where most of our uh, leads come from. Um, so yeah, I pretty much use everything free. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. I think uh, in my marketplace here up in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area, um, we have a lot of ex uh, good experience as well with those free services. So it's good, just good to know what other people are doing. So, oh, yeah, definitely. So why don't we switch a little bit and talk more about the maintenance, capital improvements, and that type of stuff. Um, I, and I think this uh, may be where you've spent a lot of your time as well in renovations. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, for example, how do you decide which renovations to do? Which ones are going to be the best, you know, bang for the buck, the most uh, improving your rents, the, the longest lasting, um, you know, that type of stuff? Well, the, the, the biggest thing is really knowing what the competitors have. Okay. So if, if right down the street, you have you know, a thousand dollar one bedroom and they have granite, they have, you know, um, you know, really good floors, uh, far as, uh, real wood floors or something like that. Um, you know, that's kind of what you want to look at, but if you're, you know, for us and just for example, we're already at eight ninety five. we may not have the granite or anything. So we may add that granite and add a little value to it. Or if we had carpet, um, we may want to change it into a laminate if we can, you know, wood look. It's not going to cost as much, um, you know, but in the long run, it will give that curb appeal. It will give it that look um, to get that $100 uh, rent bump. And then on the top of that, um, one big thing that I, I, I've always looked at and one of the biggest values, and a lot of people are doing it now, is the vinyl, um, vinyl would look flooring uh get away from carpet i mean i know most people are doing that but the the way to look at that is not only it's it's curb appeal um is looking really good um but the the um the turnaround when you can go in and not have to bring in a carpet machine you know get cleaner and clean carpet which we have our own carpet cleaner but to come in and mop a floor, sweep and mop a floor is $10 versus, you know, $40, $50 um, if you have to get somebody to clean it or get cleaner. Um, so the turnover is a lot quicker also. So um, really comparing, the answer, I guess, would be comparing it to, you know, what your competitors have, what price range or what market rate they're at and then compare and see what you can do, um, you know, that's going to be um, what's, what's going to be a good expense to get that value back because you don't want to put something in where you're going to raise uh, rents for $50, but it's going to take you, you know, three years to make that improvement. Uh, so you definitely want to, you know, try to do apples for apples, but see if it's going to be worth it also. Yep. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Obviously, you don't want to over improve the building. Um, so how do you go about your research of other, you know, competing properties? Are you doing property tours? Are your leasing agents doing property tours? Um, or are you just kind of looking at what's available online? A little bit of a little bit of everything, really. So, um, you know, I've, I've had tours myself and my wife just as we look in. I've had leasing agents do it. Um, we also, uh, what's a great tool by Zillow is once you have an account, you can actually set up parameters um, of, uh, you know, rentals in that area. So if we have an apartment complex that's in this area, that's one bedroom, one bath, you know, it's uh, 550 square feet, um, you know, with washer and dryer, you can put those parameters in uh, Zillow or Hotpad and, and you can get those market um ads sent to you as as saying hey this may be something good for you 
and it just comes right to our email. So not only, you know, I see them, the leasing agents see them and they can say, Oh wow, that this, uh, this apartment just did renovation. This is what it is. And this is what they bumped it at. So we, we, we're always seeing, um, leads and market, uh, information coming to us, um, just by doing that simple thing. And that's, again, that's no cost. You just put, just like you would be looking for a rental and we get that information every day. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. It's good to pay attention to the marketplace and uh, kind of keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on, what's, what other properties are offering and see how that compares to your own offering. So that's really good. Yeah, exactly. So then um, what about keeping your maintenance uh, contractors, you know, providing the quality that you need and uh, staying on task. Cause we all know that um, many owners and managers have issues with their contractors or handyman, whatever they might be using. Um, so what systems or processes have you put into pr practice with those people uh, to keep them on track? Um, personally, I go check a lot of them, especially if it's a uh, renovation. Um, I mean, I'm overseeing a condo project right now. So every week, um, it's kind of routine. Monday is I get the invoices. I go walk the units uh, personally. And um, and that's how I do most of them, especially with the subcontractors. Um, I have a, a maintenance supervisor that does a lot of the work in the field. And then he will, um, and I trust, and, and I've kind of trained him also, but he's been in uh, maintenance for a long time. So he knows what to look for also. So he um, kind of um, checks on a lot of subcontractors also. So if it's an AC that went out at one of the apartments or we had to do a renovation at a bathroom, I would more or less go and look at the renovation, but he would also um, you know, kind of keep, keep an eye on it too so we can look at it and check it, and which is very important when you're doing renovations with uh, contractors is to check it not when they start, and at the end, but you definitely need to check it in between to make sure they're doing it right. It may look good at the end, but it could be installed totally wrong if you didn't check it during the renovation, which is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense to just keep an eyes on the project. But I imagine that can be challenging since you have properties that are scattered over a, a wide variety, a wide area. So, you mentioned yourself as one of the main people that keeps your eyes on these things and also your project manager. Right. Uh, is there anything else that's kind of important to keep in mind to keep all those things straight? And, and you know, I'm, I myself just find myself, you know, kind of going in too many different directions, especially with the geographical spread of, of the properties. So, yeah, well, you know, one thing I've, I've done is, is really kind of try to do something that's consistent. Um, have a routine. Like I was saying, you know, Mondays I would go and check all the invoices. So the condo project, I would be there every Monday. Monday, I may pop in on a Thursday. Um, I have a meeting with my uh, uh, maintenance supervisor every morning. So when I come in, me and him get, get together for 30 minutes. He lets me know, you know, what's going on, what kind of challenges he has. Uh, if we need to, uh, if we need to bring in a subcontractor for a partic particular um, renovation or a work order that he may not be able to get to, something that's a little bit con time consuming. So every morning I do that with my maintenance guys, um, and then far as the leasing teams, the same way. You know, um, I'll have a meeting every Friday um, and just talk about, hey, what's going on. Although I'm in, the, I'm in the leasing office every day. So I'll say, hey, what, what deposits do we have coming in? And I also see everything. So the leasing agent, I see their, their calendars. So I could check right now and see where all my leasing agents are based on their calendar. Um, so it, and it tells me, um, you know, who, who the applicant is or who they're showing, who's the lead, uh, their phone number, where they are, and then also where that lead came from on their calendar. So the routine is one of the biggest things. So, and then like Tuesdays, I'll do invoices for other properties. 
uh, Wednesdays, uh, like payroll, you know, so I have, I have set things that I do every day. Um, and then miscellaneous. So really depending on what's going on after that, but mostly, um, all that routine is in the morning. And then that way afternoon after lunchtime, um, I could basically go out and see, um, if I need to check on anything particular that has come up, um, that was unexpected, that kind of thing. But biggest thing is routinely and knowing where I can find that information easily, which is a big thing is like the calendars. Yeah. 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 That makes sense to segment different responsibilities to different days of the week. I I've done something similar and and that's really helpful. Um, So I'm curious uh, what you use for your leasing agents calendar. Is it something like a, a Google shared calendar or what do you use for that? Yeah, that's all it is. It's a Google um, shared calendar. Okay. Yeah, I have, so if I look at my phone, it shows uh, my appointments, which they won't see all of my appointments, but um, if it's personal, it's on my phone. So, um, yeah, I make a little asterisk on there, um, you know, if it's something that it's for personal. Um, but I see, yeah, I, everything's Google shared mm-hmm. uh, as far as uh, with the management company. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Uh, It's great to be using those tools. So yeah, very good. So we've covered kind of the leasing process and we've covered some of the maintenance processes. Um, What about uh, accounting? You, you did just mention kind of invoicing and payroll. Are you overseeing that as well? Or do you have kind of a bookkeeper for that? So I approve every invoice. They, um, they do everything through QuickBooks and, um, or pro- through property wear, but everything mainly for payments and vendors, um, that's all through uh, QuickBooks. And then it's um, connected with the property wear system. Okay. Yeah. What about any systems surrounding the bookkeeping process? Um, you, you mentioned that you have a certain day where you review those. Um, anything else to make sure it's you know, streamlined and to make sure that no, nothing is kind of overlooked? Um, some of the things, um, I have an account manager, like I said, or uh, a, a controller. So they, so they also oversee that. So um, not only I have like a maintenance supervisor, I have a, a office manager, I have uh, the um, account manager or controller. So they also kind of look at all the funding and the financials coming through also. And then all that is um, uh, trickled to me as far as in the reporting. And there's certain days that I also meet with them too. So that accounting team, you know, we'll meet on a a Friday morning and that's when we go through, you know, if there's anything as far as we need to address on vendors or if we need to go verify uh, work or something like that, that's when we'll do it. Yeah, everything's kind of a routine, um, mainly in the morning. But, um, you know, having that that uh, weekly meeting or daily, you know, really depending on who you're dealing with um, to make sure, you know, everything is going through. There's no um, issues that you need to address right away, which is really important to have those meetings um, every day. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Um can you think of anything else from uh, business systems and processes uh, that we haven't already kind of covered here that is really important for the success of your portfolio there? What I would say is, is continuously looking at different um, avenues to, to um, save money or to uh, cut your costs. So, um, you know, vendors and contracts and everything else like that, you want to make sure that you know, especially these times, I mean, rent collection is doing really well for us, but um, it's always something annually you may want to, I just posted the other day in, in the Facebook group about uh, lawn care. You know, we're coming up on summer. Well, um, you know, lawn care is growing, you know, faster, it seems like. So it's something that, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, that, that lawn care or that vendor is not adding um, expenses where you didn't know about it or they're adding expenses um, that are not in the contract or they're adding adding expenses that 
that you shouldn't be paying for that was supposed to be uh, covered in, in the contract. So really no, you know, especially if you're dealing with um, pest control, lawn care, elevator companies, um, you know, any of those companies know what the, the, um, the contracts are and make sure what you're paying for and what you're not. Um, even dealing with general contractors on renovation, you know, you want to make sure that you're not paying um, for material that they were supposed to pay for. So it's a lot of different things, but definitely um, make sure that you're not, you know, you're cutting costs where you can um, and that your, um, you know, your expenses are in line with um, what you were planning on um, uh, spending, you know, depending on what the project is or what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, those are some great tips. I know that it can be easy, you know, if you've got your routine vendor that you go to for lawn care, as you've mentioned, you know, it can be easy just to go with the same thing over and over again. But if if you're not watching closely, you know, and kind of price shopping a little bit, you know, you, you might not realize that you're overpaying. Yeah. Um, I'm also wondering if you have any stories you can share with us about maybe a, a real challenging time you've had that was maybe from a, a tenant, a contractor, a vendor, you know, or even working with the city, you know, what was, has been really challenging and how have you learned from that? I would, I would say, I mean, honestly, this just happened the other day and I guess now you're bringing it up, um, is to document everything that you can. So, um, you know, with the city, so, so one of our properties, we have section eight and, um, this one particular, uh, um, uh, section eight inspection, they came in, um, and I don't know why, but New Orleans subcontracts their inspectors now when there used to be employees by New Orleans, hired by New Orleans and, and lived here. And now they subbed out their inspectors. So anyway, they, um, they changed to this vendor and we were not getting the, um, the letters that we were supposed to, to tell us when the uh, inspections were. So anyway, December came, um, they went and in, in inspected this unit, it failed. And it, was, it failed about something that was outside of the unit, which has never been in the, um, the list or whatever uh, that they, they would check. But anyway, we, um, we didn't know about it. They went, the tenant didn't tell us about it for some reason. They went back again and it failed again. So in, in section eight, they, they'll abate the rent that section eight will um, pay if it fails twice. So um, I finally found out about that. The tenant told me, said, hey, look, they, they failed again because of this, the paint was chipping on the outside of the building. I'm like, they've never failed that before. But anyway, long story short, the COVID came in and um, they abated the rent for February and that or March when they started all this stuff going on. So you couldn't get a hold of anybody. So I finally got a hold of the uh, the um, the person and said, you know, why why did it take that long? And I know COVID. They didn't come back and inspect it until like the end of March. So they held the rent back. I went back and I said, hey, look. So we didn't know. I could prove that y'all were sending the letters to a different address. I proved that because of the document that we had. And then we also had um, the work order that was put in by the tenant and our notes by the maintenance people, uh, our maintenance guys that fixed it right after we were notified. I proved all that to them and uh, I got the email yesterday that we're getting that rent. Hmm. So they all that abatement rent that they said that they were going to hold back they, they are going to forward that rent to us now. Hmm. So the, the, the more of the story that is, is to make sure that you document everything that you can. Hmm. So make sure that you keep up your work orders, when it was done, who it was done by, and keep emails that, um, you know, proven that you had that communication or you didn't have that communication. So making sure that communication and document um, everything that you can. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's, there's a lot of moving parts as we've talked about. Uh, there's a lot of people that you're dealing with. And yeah, it's important to keep track of all those communications and uh, 
you know, for future reference when something like this comes up. So, right. yeah, definitely. Very good. We're going to be wrapping things up here in a moment, but I want to just give you another opportunity to let us know any other kind of tips that you have for people that are managing a large portfolio and how they can really achieve those highest returns for the property owners and um, really have a great experience for the tenants as well. You know, the biggest thing is really communicating um, with the tenants also, you know, so when we, we, um, we have a 60 day notice um, in our lease. So the tenant needs to tell us 60 days before um, if they want to renew or not. And what we do, we do it as a courtesy to remind them also, but it's also a time that we do is making sure that, you know, their maintenance issues are done um, correctly. Everything's fine with their unit, that they're enjoying their unit. Um, so that, that communication. And then also, um, we also have uh, inspection or walkthrough every, every quarter. So every three months, we have a pest control contractor that we do as a preventative maintenance. Uh, we go through and I have my maintenance supervisor go through with the pest control. And that, at that same time, we, um, you know, we have the maintenance greets the tenants if they're there. And we make sure that smoke alarms, um, you know, the condition of the unit as well, and that we're not missing any uh, preventative maintenance um, that they that may not be calling us for. You know, so we, we try to have that communication with the tenants to make sure that they're enjoying their stay. And then on return, you know, obviously that stops with, um, you know, helps uh, prevent uh, turnover. Okay. And we also ask them, you know, if they put in their notice that they want to move out, you know, we always ask them why, you know, if it's, you know, moving out of town for work or whatever it is, I want to make sure at the end of the day that they're not moving out for something that we could have prevented. Hmm. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. I'm, that's a lot of good points right there. Uh, getting feedback from those tenants uh, to make sure they're satisfied, uh, visiting the po property quarterly. I think that's really important there. Um, and I don't think everybody, uh, in fact, probably many property owners and managers are not visiting their properties that frequently. Um, no. So that's, I'm sure, helping really to preserve the properties and, you know, prevent uh, bigger maintenance concerns from happening. Absolutely. So it's a lot. It's uh believe me, my, my phone, I've got to charge it by 11 o'clock. <laughs> you know, it, it's a lot. I look at a lot of emails, a lot of calendars, um, a lot of things. And it, just like you said, it's a lot of moving parts and, you know, keeping up with it. It's just, I don't know, I guess I've just been doing it for so long that I've, I've, um, you know, just created that, that routine and, and, you know, making sure that I know what's going on at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Well, that sounds good. And I appreciate you taking some time to be with us on the show today. Um, I do have some closing questions as we get to the end here um, right. so that the audience can get to know you a little bit better. Um, so the first question is, why do you get up in the morning? Why do I get up in the morning? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I enjoy life. Um, you know, one part of that, one big part of that question is, is my why, my why I get up every day. So, um, you know, I can see my wife and my kids. I've got five grandkids that, um, we love to go and see every day. So, you know, we, uh, we bust our butt every day, every time we get up, um, it's for a reason. And that, uh, you know, that reason is to have that financial freedom, uh, one day so we can spend more time with our kids and our grandkids. Yeah, very good. Family's important there. Uh, second question is, what event or person in your past was monumental in creating who you are today? Um, I would have to say my dad. You know, my dad, um, he's always been a really hard worker. Um, unfortunately, you know, he's always been in a W-2 job. And, um, you know, I see, I've seen him not spend as much time as I would have liked 
And that's what I want. I want to create something where eventually I can get away from a W-2 job and, and teach. You know, that's one of the biggest reasons why I, um, you know, came up with a Facebook um, group, you know, help, help show and share value so others can, um, you know, create wealth and grow together. You know, I don't want to do contract work all my life. I want to teach others, make my job easier. And that, that goes the same way with being a, you know, an asset manager, a property manager, or even an owner. You know, you want to you want to build your team where you can walk away and everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing to make my life easier. And I could be on calls like this or um, spending time with my family. So that that's the ultimate goal. goal. And that's, you know, um, I've learned a lot from my dad, um, not as an entrepreneur, but as hard work. I don't really want to do that until I'm 65 years old. Sure. Got it. Well, that kind of leads into my third question, which was how can people get in touch with you? And uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, what's the name of the Facebook group? The Facebook group that I created was uh, it's the multifamily asset management and value add um, Facebook group. Uh, created it to add value. Um, um, we've got a lot of good stuff on there. Uh, I'm always on there. I'm always on Facebook as a, under my name also. So, you know, just trying to, um, you know, just grow with everyone and, and, um, you know, help grow, to grow together. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate the, like I said, I appreciate the group that you put together there. And I think just adds collaboration to our investment community and uh, property managers, asset managers. And so it's really great that we can all learn from each other. And so I appreciate your contribution to that. Yeah, no problem. No problem at all. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. So thank you so much. And to our audience, uh, if you got anything out of this conversation, uh, let us know. You can go ahead and comment on wherever you're seeing this or hearing this, maybe the YouTube channel, or if you are listening to this on the go, uh, it's great if you can give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate your feedback that way. So thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you on the next one. Take care. Thank you, John. The opinions shared on this show are for informational purposes only and should not be taken as a solicitation for representation or investments in any specific offering. Please consult with your financial, legal, tax, and real estate advisor before making any investment decisions. John Stiles is a licensed Minnesota real estate agent with Bridge Realty. Thanks for tuning in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. If you're considering scaling up, downsizing, or right-sizing your real estate investment portfolio, it's important to know how to determine your property's value in today's market. That's why I've put together a free ebook for you called How to Calculate Your Investment Property's Value. To get your copy, go to www.realestatestyles.com forward slash value. Now, if you found any value in today's show, be sure to subscribe to our email newsletter, YouTube channel, and podcast through your favorite podcast player. All the links are in the show notes. And would you do me a big favor? Help me get the word out about this show by sharing with your friends on Facebook and LinkedIn. And lastly, we appreciate your five-star rating on iTunes. I really appreciate you and wish you the best in your real estate investing career. Signing off, I'm John Stiles with Bridge Realty. Make it a great day.